So welcome everyone. Uh, today we're talking about population genetics. So we are entering the module of population genetics and disease genomics. So today we're talking about population differences and genetic variation. Uh, the second lecture will be on disease association. So basically how do we carry out a genome-wide association study and how do we uh, understand it? And the next one will be quantitative trait mapping and looking at differences in the intermediate phenotypes. And then lastly, uh, systems genetics and genome-wide variation. So we've been basically building a lot of toolkits for understanding genomes. And now we're gonna apply all these toolkits to understand genetic variation in disease, and then to talk about variation between species. So uh, these are the four lectures. So we're gonna look at how do we measure and understand human variation today? And then we're gonna get into phenotypic variation uh, next week. So uh, first of all, how do we uh, build genetic variation maps for the human genome? How do we detect variation? How do we quantify it? And what are some of the initial insights? So I'll give you a brief history of human genetics uh, about the genome, variation, SNPs, indels, uh, CNVs, STRs. And then we're gonna talk about how to detect them in a thousand genome project and in other projects and how do we call variants from sequencing reads and then we're going to switch to haplotypes, human relatedness, human demographic history, and then measuring human selection at multiple scales. So inheritance has been understood for a long time. We've been basically selectively breeding animals and plants for a long time. We basically went from you know, animals that will eat you to uh, man's best friend. We've selected uh, both animals and plants for their traits. This is what corn used to look like. I think it was uh, known as teosante and it's it completely inedible. And of course, it's a major source of food today. So these stories uh, date back to ancient, ancient times. And even from ancient Greece, basically, there were a lot of theories that have somehow uh, polluted modern uh, evolutionary theory. If you look at Anaximander, he would argue that the first human was in fact born from a non-human relative and that there was probably a fish origin of the land animals. In 300 BC, Aristotle was basically the first to create a taxonomy of the species and a classification. And, uh, you know, a lot of other philosophers were basically arguing about uh, seedlings. And uh, as early as 450 BC, Empedocles was basically arguing for a random mixing of traits with natural variation where the successful ones survive giving the semblance of purpose. So, you know, again, preluding a lot of what, uh, you know, Darwin's theory made so clear. And uh, again, in 300 BC, Epicurus had this purely naturalistic generation of diversity without any supernatural intervention. Of course, these were a huge minority, a tiny minority compared to this huge majority that were um, sort of believing in some kind of divine force uh, driving uh, a clear movement to the betterment of which humans uh, represent the epitome, as opposed to so this natural adaptation view of uh, standing selection. So this, of course, with the Renaissance uh, was uh, expanded upon dramatically and clarified dramatically. So we went from the ideas of Lamarck, who basically had this transmutation idea of sort of getting into this complexity force that is pushing species to become more complex as opposed to adaptation. Um, and then he had the idea of the spontaneous generation of very simple life forms and then an innate force that drives increased complexity. So, you know, no, no basis uh, in reality, unfortunately. That's where uh, the Darwinian ideas were completely revolutionary, this whole idea of a continuum of species of random mutation which is the source of diversity and that there isn't just one elephant that basically within elephants there's you know a huge continuum of phenotypic traits upon which natural selection acts with fitness uh, of course darwin's ideas were not complete there was a lot of blending inheritance and he had this concept of gemules that would basically gather information from everywhere in the body to create the egg, you know, followed by, uh, you know, this development of the embryo, this information being spread back out. Um, 
And he had a lot of Lamarckian uh, ideas about sort of epigenetic changes, uh, as we would call them now, uh, feeding back into the genetic information, which will then impact the next generation. Uh, of course, now we understand that this is, you know, bogus, that instead the uh, germline has no feedback or at least minimal feedback from the rest of the body and that the vast majority of the source of feedback is through the act of selection for whatever traits this germline generates. So, uh, you know, again, huge advance of this continuum of species, but still some things to be resolved. Uh, contemporaneously with Darwin, Mendel uh, basically was uh, the first to recognize the inheritance without any blending the concept of discrete units of inheritance, which are genes, the concept of dominant versus recessive alleles that can basically be hidden in a particular generation phenotypically, but are still present at the genotype. And that depending on which combination of genotypes you have, you can basically observe only the dominant or the recessive alleles. And this concept of independent assortment, namely a concept of digital inheritance, the fact that um, you could have round or, you know, uh, fizzly, you could have colored or white, you could have, you know, uh, multiple traits which were independently uh, recombined. So Mendel's ideas unfortunately became uh, completely ignored for about 50 years until um, the 20th century. And the reason for that is that uh, contrary to Mendelian inheritance, this biometric school of uh, inheritance was basically observing continuous phenotypes. It wasn't just like everybody's born with either blue eyes or brown eyes. There's a whole continuum with every spectrum. You know, and everybody's not born with either black or blonde hair. There's a whole continuum of color. And these ideas are basically, um, you know, very difficult to reconcile at first view with this concept of discrete inheritance from Mendel. So even Mendel himself was wondering if his rules of inheritance were applying also in humans outside his P experiments and whether in fact the rules of evolution and genetics and inheritance were global across different species. And of course, along with those, there was a lot of other, uh, there were a lot of other theories like saltationism where giant leaps are happening, orthogenesis, vitalism, neolamarchism, uh, theistic evolution and so on and so forth. So in the last century with uh, Ron Fisher, uh, we basically have seen the blending of Mendelian inheritance and um, this continuous trait variation with the realization that continuous phenotypic variation can be explained simply by multiple Mendelian loci. The concept that height might appear to be continuously varying across individuals, but you don't need uh, sort of continuous alleles. You could simply deal with discrete alleles, each of which has a modest effect on the phenotype combining to give this semblance of a continuum uh, of genetic variation. And you should realize that this is all well before 1953 when the structure of DNA was solved and recognized as the basis of inheritance and well before even chromosomes or DNA or genetic material were uh, understood. So there's you know, a lot of major leaps that have happened theoretically before we actually had the practical instantiation of what is actually a gene. And that came with the work of uh, linkage mapping by Morgan and his student Sturtevant, who basically first constructed a genetic map of these traits that Mendel was talking about as independently assorting were in fact deviating from Mendel's rules when the genes were closer to each other on the chromosome. And the amount of deviation, namely the recombination between these traits would allow you to map these genetic variants in a linear map along the chromosome. This was a breakthrough, basically, you know, well before we had the structure of DNA or we understood that, you know, um, chromosomes are the basic, the basis of inheritance or that this was widely accepted in the scientific community, there was already this ability to start mapping these mysterious things that, you know, we now call genes 
and alleles and genetic loci onto these chromosomes. So based on these very simple, uh, in retrospect, <laughs> um, uh, method for constructing these genetic maps, the Mendelian uh, trait mapping revolution happened in the 80s, where we could now start mapping individual strong effect, single gene Mendelian mutations onto specific genetic loci based on their co-inheritance patterns relative to other loci. And this, of course, has been um, in many ways complemented, but in some ways also superseded by the um, human gen genome sequencing, the complete sequencing of the human genome in the turn of the century uh, of the millennium, and the incredible wealth of genome-wide association studies that have been um, possible through mapping of individual genetic variants of modest effects across thousands of individuals that are unrelated rather than the traditional Mendelian mapping of pedigree. And that has led to uh, number one, of course, the human genome, number two, the variation maps of human genetic variation, the haplotype concept of blocks of inheritance, and of course, genome-wide association studies, and now increasingly the recognition of not just common alleles, but also rare variants that are segregating in the population and affecting our phenotypes across a huge number of traits, from cardiovascular to drug response to all kinds of cancer biological processes, neuronal processes and cognition, uh, immune diseases, metabolic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, digestive disorders, lipid inflammation, hematological, body weight measurements, cardiovascular, and so on and so forth. So what we are now recognizing is that our genes play an enormous effect on our physiology, but also on our cognition. And we have the tools for mapping them systematically. So that's the challenge that we have today. So basically, how do we use these genetic studies to understand the molecular basis of disease? And our, our goal for the next few lectures is going to be how do we use all of the tools that we've learned about so far at the service of genomic medicine, of understanding the molecular basis of human disease. So the promise of genetics is that it's unbiased. It, you know, um, even if genes were made out of green cheese, genetics would still work. It, you know, there's no, um, no particular mechanism that you need to assume in order for genetics to work. It's completely unbiased. Number two, it gives you causality. And causality is a luxury in epidemiology. The challenge with epidemiology is that it's always been about correlation. It's always been about, oh, if you uh, drink more coffee, you live longer. Well, you know, why is that? Is it because you are richer? You can afford to go to Starbucks. And, uh, you know, if you're also richer, that, that means you also have better healthcare and therefore you live longer, better, you know, lifestyle and so on and so forth. Or is it really that coffee makes you live longer? Or is it that living longer makes you drink more coffee? I mean, so all of these causality, uh, directionality versus correlation is something that has been very difficult in epidemiology, but with genetic variation that you are born with, it's been finally able, it's, it's been finally possible to, to argue about causality. It allows you to basically, uh, you know, discover new disease mechanisms through the discovery of new genes and new genetic loci that are associated with disease and ultimately finding new target genes for new therapeutics and enabling both precision medicine of going after individual genetic, uh, you know, determinants of disease, but also uh, personalized medicine of tuning perhaps the therapeutics to your particular genetic makeup. So that's the promise of genetics. The promise is that we can go through the genome, carry out genome-wide association studies, and then infer the genetic loci underpinning these loci, and from that gain all this. The trouble, of course, is that when you look at the genetic loci underlying the vast majority of genome-wide association studies, you find that in 93% of cases, the disease hits do not affect the protein directly. Instead, they affect the circuitry. 
So all of these tools that we've been building for understanding the epigenome, for understanding regulatory motifs, for understanding networks, for making sense of all of these complexity of gene regulation is in fact front and center in the battle against human disease. To understand these genetic loci, we need to understand the underlying mechanism of how these genetic variants are acting. We need to understand how every single nucleotide and every single variant in the human genome impacts function. We need to understand the target genes of these loci, which is not always obvious. So in this particular case, there's this very strong genetic association with obesity sitting exactly at this FTO gene locus. But if you look at these 89 common variants associated with obesity in this FTO locus, they all sit in the first intron of the FTO gene and you know, it's a tiny part of the second uh, intron, but none of them affects the protein. So even though many people had assumed that FTO is the gene that's the target of this locus, what we showed uh, in, in our own work is that the target of this locus sits 1.2 million nucleotides away and 600,000 nucleotides away in these IRX3 and IRX5 genes. So the target gene is always not, is very often not known. The causal variant is not known, the cell type of action is not known, the relevant pathways are not known and the mechanisms are not known. So what we're gonna be doing the next, you know, in, in this group of four lectures in this module is number one, understanding natural genetic variation and then using all of these tools to understand the intermediate phenotypes that are affected by these variants and how ultimately they impact disease. So here's the scope of the challenge. In every single one of your cells, you have these two meters worth of DNA packed inside your cells that have two copies of your genome in 23 chromosomes with roughly 20,000 genes and 3.2 billion letters of DNA. That's what we need to understand. We need to understand how every single letter functions in order to understand the impact of millions of polymorphic sites. Poly means many, Morphic means forms, many forms. So polymorphic is something that is segregating the human population in multiple forms, okay? Sounds good? So who's with me so far? Let's do a quick poll. Awesome. Beautiful, so 80%, 20%, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so if you look at genetic variation between individuals, it happens in many forms. So the first thing to recognize is that 99.9% .9 of DNA is shared between you and every other person on the planet. So basically, you know, those who go to war, <laughs> remember you are fighting against your brothers. Those who, uh, you know, um, again, if you understand the, the, the brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity, uh, it's very hard to sort of, you know, go up in arms against any fellow human. So 99.9% .9 of DNA is shared between any two individuals. It's only in the remainder one, you know, less than 1%, one per thousand of the genome that the variation in that remainder explains all of our predisposition differences. And of course, the remaining phenotypic variation has to do with environment and stochastic differences, okay? And the, 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 the variation happens in many forms. The most common by far, which happens every thousand bases, is a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. Nothing fancy, single nucleotide. It means it affects a single nucleotide. And polymorphisms mean it has many forms. So this is either a C, or a G at that location. And of this, we have millions of those. Then <clears throat> there's insertions and deletions. So for example, one allele has a C, another allele has a C followed by T, A, T, G, G. So that's an indel. And that's roughly one every 10,000 nucleotides. Then there's short tandem repeats where you basically have GTC, 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 GTC repeated a variable number of times. And this also happens once every 10,000 bases. And then the you know, big ones are either structural variants or copy number variants. And these are quite large. They affect you know, on median 5,000 base pairs. And they are deletions, duplications, or inversions. And those happen roughly every million bases in the gene. Everybody with me so far? 
So the question is whether single nucleotide polymorphisms have an impact. And if you look at the genetic code, you basically can see that if you change a nucleotide, for example, in the fourth, sorry, in the third codon position, which is fourfold degenerate, you basically have no change in the amino acid. So outside proteins, most of the variants have no impact. Within proteins, about a third of the variants have no impact. But the other third can basically dramatically alter the function if you actually switch the amino acid of translation. So basically, uh, many modern analyses like genome-wide association studies and EQTLs will focus on SNPs and indels. And very often, these have only two alleles. These are the states. And they're identified as you know, some reference uh, ID, so RSID. And the submitted sequences are, uh, that, that contain a variant are clustered. And we now have these DB SNP or database of single nucleotide polymorphisms that now has more than 100 million known variants. And here's one example, RS1891071123. What does that do? It changes a C into a, T, a, a G, okay? It sounds, you know, uh, pretty benign until you realize that in fact it changes a glutamic acid into a valine. And this is actually the underlying basis of single cell, sickle cell anemia. So basically that's when your blood cells are in fact having the sickle form and they're unable to transport as much oxygen. So that can lead to all kinds of uh, problems. So of course, sickle cell anemia is uh, you know, devastating disease, but the reason why this variant is actually frequent in the uh, human population is because this was actually selected because the individuals who have this mutation or who are at least heterozygous for this mutation uh, are much less likely to contact malaria. So if you look at the region of sub-Saharan Africa where malaria is prevalent, you also see that the allele that is predisposing these individuals to sickle cell anemia is actually you know, much more prevalent. Here's another example. So basically we talked about SNP variations uh, such as for sickle cell anemia. Uh, you can also have this uh, short tandem repeat variation. So this uh, STR variation where, for example, underlying Huntington's disease is one of those uh, short tandem repeats. If you have nine copies of CAG in this HTT gene underlying Huntington's disease, Huntington, uh, you're fine. If you have 12, 10 copies, you're fine. If you have 12 copies, you're fine. But if you have 30 or more copies, then you get an abnormal protein which damages your neurons. It leads to brain cell death and all kinds of impacts on mood, coordination, speaking, dementia, et cetera. So um, again, these are happening throughout the genome. Most of the time they don't have an, an impact, but when they do hit an important gene, they have a devastating impact. And here's another example with in, an indel. So basically this is the cystic fibrosis gene, CFTR, where if you basically uh, you know, insert this uh, you know, particular uh, sequence or, or if you uh, delete it, you end up with these uh, infections in the lung with cysts and fibrosis uh, leading to, of course, the name of cystic fibrosis. And then this is an insertion of you know, um, a particular uh, amino acid, okay? And you know, that, that can, again, have devastating consequences. So what we're going to be focusing on today is how do we catalog and how do we understand human genetic variation and how do we use that to also understand human history and population differences between uh, individuals. So first of all, we need a language for referring to these variant alleles. So to distinguish the two alleles, we can talk about the, uh, whether it matches the reference human genome. And the reference human genome is, you know, some person from uh, Buffalo, New York, that is just a random person on the planet. So for every allele, you can basically ask, does it match the human reference? Does it match this random human among us? Or does it not match that, rom that random human uh, among us? Okay. So that's sort of the most unbiased view of talking about alleles. 
We could also ask if an allele is the major allele or the minor allele, if it's more or less frequent in the population. The challenge with this one, of course, is that there's no, uh, basically, you, you don't always have the major allele be the major allele everywhere. There are some smaller population where the minor allele across the planet is in fact the major allele in that population. Um, you could also ask, does it match the most recent common ancestor between human and uh, chimp? So you can ask if it's an ancestral allele or a derived allele. And again, the problem there is that uh, some spots are just simply not found in chimp. So you might not have an ancestral or derived uh, annotation. And you could also ask if it's disease associated or not, if it's the risk allele or the protective allele. But again, the challenge there is that if you think of malaria, then the sickle cell anemia, uh, anemia um, uh, allele is actually the protective allele against malaria, but it's the risk allele for sickle cell anemia. So basically the risk non-risk depends on the environment. If you look at obesity, of course, the risk allele for obesity is pretty bad today, but it was actually pretty beneficial when food was scarce because you could store a lot more calories from your diet. So that's the first uh, sort of uh, realization that there's basically many ways of classifying these alleles. You can also classify these alleles by their allele frequency. So we're gonna to refer to common alleles if they're more than 5%, to low frequency alleles if they're between 0.5 and 5, uh, to rare alleles if they're less than 0.5%, and then to private or de novo variants if uh, you know, they're found in only one person, or sometimes if they're a subset of a person, if you have a mutation that happened during the development of the embryo that gave rise to you as a person, you might have some subset of your cells that have an additional mutation that the rest of your cells don't have. And that's what we're gonna call a somatic mutation, somatic because it's not in the germline, it's, um, it's in the rest of the body. So here's an example, RS whatever, uh, you know, here's the allele, the reference allele, the minor allele, and then, you know, whether it's ancestral or not, okay? So what you should really embrace from the beginning of this lecture is that the frequency of an allele is not happening at random. Basically, if an allele is very detrimental, it will probably not be very common. And the reason for that is that selection will basically act against it. So when we're talking about common alleles, most of the time they're having a very modest effect on the phenotype. By contrast, rare alleles can have a very strong effect. And of course, private alleles and de novo alleles and somatic alleles are not very much in selection, especially if it's, you know, a late onset phenotype, for example. And therefore they are allowed to have much stronger effects. So if it's a common allele, chances that it has a low effect. And if it has a high effect, chances are it's a very rare allele, okay? So you can basically look at the uh, continuum and I really want you to embrace this as a continuum rather than, oh, there's two types of variants. There's common, you know, low effect variants and then rare high effect variants. No, not really. Uh, it's really a continuum where you basically can have lots of low frequency variants with intermediate effects. And of course you can have an enormous number of rare variants with modest effects because rare variants come in all forms and shapes and sizes. So the vast majority of rare variants have no effect, just like the vast majority of common variants. So, um, you know, it's just that we don't have power to identify those. So what we usually do is that we either, when we discover an allele, it tends to be either common of low effect or rare of strong effect, because that's where our power is. The further down you go this way, the less power you have to discover them. And of course, there's very, very few examples of high effect common variants that influence common disease. One example is, for example, the apolipoprotein E, where the E4 allele has uh, an enormous risk for Alzheimer's disease. It carries half the genetic risk for Alzheimer's in one locus. And, you know, that's very much an exception because it's both common and high effect. 
Okay. So let's see who's with me on this continuum between common versus rare and between strong effect versus uh, weak effect allele. <clears throat> okay, so we have 70%, 30%, 0, 0, 0. Um, all right, so understanding now this continuum, we can start asking where is genetic variation useful? If you're looking at rare alleles that cause Mendelian disease, then it's of course hugely useful to the person carrying it as a prognostic for whether they're likely to get sick. By contrast, if you carry a common allele, it really doesn't tell you much about whether you're gonna get sick or not. It's instead the polygenic many genes, poly means many, genic means genes, the polygenic effect of many, many, many common variants that together allows you to know what is your predisposition for a particular disorder, okay? So at the rare end of the spectrum, genetic variation can inform therapeutic development. You can identify a target gene, you can, oh, sorry. It, it, can, it can inform personalized genomic medicine. You can provide individualized medical insights, diagnostics in cases of severe genetic disorders, identification of individuals more or less likely to benefit from specific therapeutic interventions, and then prediction of individuals at risk for severe idiosyncratic adverse drug responses. And unfortunately, this personalized end of the spectrum has been vastly oversold for years, but technological advances are finally bringing to reality what has long been a futuristic vision. So that's at this end of the spectrum for the Mendelian disorders. For the common variants, instead, you should think of them as informing therapeutic development for all of humanity, rather than for that one person who's carrying the variant. Because we can identify new target genes, screen chemicals against those genes, build animal models, and eventually conduct clinical trials in humans. And uh, you know, therapeutic development desperately needs new insights into human biology and genetics is perhaps the most powerful way to get those insights because the, ther the therapeutics that come out of genetics are much more likely to actually succeed in those clinical trials, okay? So now how do we represent and store genetic variation? So again, remember humans are diploid organisms. So that means that every individual carries two homologous copies of every single chromosome. And therefore you have two copies of every variant and you can call them the maternal or the paternal allele. Although most of the time we're not gonna care if it was mom who gave it to you or dad. And those variants co-occur within haplotypes which are inherited as a unit. Okay, so we're gonna talk a lot more about haplotypes shortly. So those haplotypes are basically telling you about the string, we're gonna talk about the haplotype blocks. So those haplotypes are basically telling you the string of particular variants that you have inherited from the mom and from the dad. And then your genotype tells you at every one of those loci, do you have zero, one, or two alleles from say the alternate, okay? So here I have zero alternate alleles, here I have one alternate allele, here I have two alternate alleles. If I have, if I have two alternate alleles, it's pretty clear that mom and dad gave me one. If I have zero, it's pretty clear that neither mom nor dad gave me one. But if I have one, then I really don't know if it was mom or dad that gave it to me, okay? And that's gonna be important in what we call phasing or you know, haplotyping in terms of going from this genotype that captures both alleles together to the haplotype that captures the separation, the deconvolution of those uh, alleles. So uh, inferring haplotypes is experimentally possible, but it's currently infeasible to directly measure these haplotypes over the whole genome, because basically, you know, phasing them, figuring out which variation goes with which variation across very different loci is very hard. Something that's much cheaper and much more efficient to measure are genotypes, because you simply need to build a microarray 
And then with that microarray, you basically hybridize the reference and the alternate for every locus in the genome that is known to be poly polymorphic in the population that you're testing. And then you basically ask how many, you know, how much signal intensity they, did they have in the hybridization to the risk or the non-risk or the reference or the alternate. Genotyping, however, loses information and you need algorithms and statistical models to recover it, okay? And that's where phasing comes in and that's where also imputation comes in, okay? So we're gonna talk about those challenges uh, shortly. So the goal <clears throat> of uh, human genetics uh, is of course to understand disease, but as a prelude to that, what you need to do is understand and systematically catalog human genetic variation. So the first step for that is sequencing lots of individuals to discover the variants in the first place. The second step is cataloging those common variants and the co-inheritance patterns in these haplotype blocks. And step three is genotyping a much larger set of individuals. So you sequence, I don't know, the order of thousands to discover the variation. And once you have the variants, you then genotype on the order of millions of individuals. And then you can estimate population specific properties and disease associated properties and so on and so forth. And the projects that enable that were initially HapMap for haplotype mapping project, uh, and then followed by the thousand genomes uh, project. So how do you discover genetic variation? Well, you sequence and then you align. So we've talked about sequencing, we've talked about alignment, so you do that over and over and over again. And then you map all of your sequencing reads onto the reference human genome. And then you basically ask what were the locations of the genome that were polymorphic, that actually had variation. So high throughput sequencing is commonly used to measure these molecular phenotypes like gene expression, QC modifications. And in everything we've talked about with chip seek and RNA seek and et cetera, we've ignored the mismatches. And instead we've matched the reads that were highly similar. But these might actually represent true sequence variants. And we need statistical methods to distinguish true variants from simply errors. And that's where variant calling comes in. So there's a huge industry uh, in genomics for whole genome variant calling. One of the most widely used is this GATK haplotype caller that basically uses heuristics to find mismatches that are not explained by noise and therefore likely represent true variation. So what you basically do is that you use an assembly graph and we talked a little bit about those graphs when we talked about the novo transcriptome assembly. So you basically have graphs of variation that split in the places where you have SNPs and then remerge after those. And then the question is for every haplotype, what is the probability of observing a read that has an A given the haplotype that I have. And that's probabilistic and that's a generative model. You can use a hidden Markov model to basically walk along the genome and say, which haplotype am I at currently? Where the states might be insertion, deletion, substitution, and the emissions might be pairs of aligned nucleotides and gaps. And the transitions are basically equivalent to the insertion deletion gap penalties from Smith-Waterman. And we talked about this dynamic programming uh, alignment before. And using this probability of read given the haplotype, using this sort of generative model, we can then infer by Bayes rule, the probability of being in a particular haplotype given the read. And you can assign genotypes to each sample based on the maximum a posteriori haplotypes. So you're basically inferring, you know, particular regions that you care about, and then you're inferring the plausible haplotypes, and then you de determine for every read what is the likelihood that this read has a G or a T at that location, and then you sort of annotate the samples accordingly. So that's for uh, genetic variant calling from whole genome sequencing. There's a lot of work also in exome sequencing, where you're basically sequencing specifically only the exons. And the reason is that it's just cheaper. And that's where a lot of the strong effect variants are likely to be perturbing the proteins directly. So again, the motivation is that the exome has actually very different sequence properties than the rest of the genome in substitution rates and GC content. And you can train a logistic regression classifier to predict which mismatches are errors 
and which are actually true polymorphic variants. So you can basically train using the thousand genomes exome project sequencing reads, where more than two reads, for example, align with a mismatch. And you can have a set of true positives where the reads, uh, you know, the, these are the reads where the mismatch was also discovered in the exome pilot project and the true negatives are your remaining reads. And then as features in this classification framework, you have your mismatch quality scores, your flanking quality score, whether the neighboring nucleotides were swapped, normalization uh, of the distance to the three prime end of the read where the quality usually drops. And this you know, particular uh, exome variant color is basically much, much faster than the full Bayesian uh, model. And it has a lower positive rate. And you can see more information here. So using this uh, calling for both whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing, the 1000 Genomes Project has basically cataloged 2,500 whole genome sequences at low depth. This is 4x instead of 30x, which would be high depth, across 26 subpopulations spanning the globe. So for example, in Kenya, in Finland, in Central European uh, populations, Mexican, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, so Han Chinese, Japan, um, and so on and so forth. So, there's been a lot of uh, results from this thousand genomes project. First, of course, is this enormous amount of data. Second is a catalog of genetic variation across the genome. And third is actually sophisticated statistical tools for phasing, for imputation that account for noise, for known patterns of variation, such as linkage to equilibrium and so on and so forth. Okay. So that basically gives us the basis upon which we can then build uh, genetic variation maps to relate to human disease. And you can see here a little bit of sort of the population variation of these uh, variants across the human population. So for example, you can ask what fraction of the population in a particular country is or in a particular sample site is actually shared across all continents. And you can see here that, for example, if you have a variant in Mexico, chances are that you actually have it everywhere else. Um, but if you have a variant in Africa, a lot of variation in Africa is not actually found outside Africa. And the reason for this is, of course, the out of Africa event where the you know, standing variation of human diversity that was living in Africa was only partially sampled in the subset of individuals who left Africa to basically populate the rest of the world. But by the time they got here, they were carrying variants that were actually seen everywhere else. Okay. So we now have this basic catalog of human genetic variation. What you'd like to do next is go and measure it. So basically the key insight is that most genetic variants in an individual are recurrent in the population. Once you've discovered them and cataloged them, you can basically build a common genotyping array for measuring them. And then DNA microarrays were the key technological advance of the 1990s. And the idea is that you have a fragment of the sample DNA that contains the SNPs, and you can hybridize it by reverse complementation to probes in your array. And one of the probes will have the risk or the reference allele. The other one will have the non-risk or say the alternate allele. And you can tag these fragments with fluorescent compound, use intensity to recover which probes were bound and which alleles were present in the sample between zero, one, or two copies of the alternate allele. And to date, still the fundamental technology used in large-scale population genetic assays. If you look at 23andMe or Ancestry.com or any of these, you basically have these microarrays as the basis, the, you know, the workhorse of human genetics. So of course, next is the study of disease associations across populations. And that requires new array designs due to differences in polymorphisms and in leakage equilibrium across populations. So if you want to do a genome association study in an African population, you will use a different set of SNPs than if you want to do it in an Asian population or in a European ancestry population and so on and so forth. So what we've talked about so far is genetic variation, how to detect it, how to quantify it, and some initial insights about the extent of variation in the human population and some of its sources. What I'd like to talk about next is 
haplotype blocks, recombination, linkage disequilibrium, and phasing. Okay, so we're going to first do a quick introduction of the biology of meiosis and recombination and where are these hotspots coming from, and also this PRDM9 protein and its motif evolution, and then talk about linkage disequilibrium, about haplotype blocks, and about imputation and phasing. So if you look at identity by descent in related individuals, you basically have uh, parents that actually share 50% of their DNA with their children. So every parent gave some combination of their genetic material in blue, say for dad and in red for mom, some combination of that genetic material went to each child, okay? So siblings also share 50% of the DNA with each other, but these are actually different 50%. So basically notice the parents are actually unrelated <laughs> as they should be. And the children are uh, each inheriting uh, DNA from mom and from dad, but from either the maternal uh, grandpa or the maternal grandma uh, in each case, okay? So here's a comparison of my son's DNA uh, versus my DNA. So you can see here that at 100% of the genome, we are exactly 50% identical. And the reason for that is because I gave him, you know, uh, either my mom's DNA or my dad's DNA at every locus. And my wife also gave him either mom's DNA or dad's or her mom's or her dad's DNA at every locus. Okay. So that's, um, you know, <laughs> a running joke between me and my wife is that when my son was born, uh, very pale skinned and blonde and blue eyed, people were like, oh, where does he get his blonde hair? And I uh, always joked, oh, probably his dad. And uh, my wife sent me this picture when uh, the genetic results came in for my son saying, well, you know, she only said, wrote paternity to JPEG. And she sent me this picture. She's like, you can stop making that joke now. Um, anyway, so this is now a very different comparison. This is a comparison between my brother and me. And you can see that that 50% is actually very different. My brother and I are basically 100% identical for about a quarter of our genome, depending on, of course, on the random meiosis events that my mom and my dad had when they were generating, you know, the sperm and the egg that made me and that made my brother. That's a quarter of the genome, roughly, that is, you know, 100% identical. There's another quarter of the genome where we are completely different, where basically both mom and dad gave us just completely different uh, copies. And then there's about another half of the genome where we are, you know, 50% identical. What I want you to focus on is these arrows here. Basically, what happens? How do we switch between 50% identical and 100% identical and 0% identical? That's basically a location where we both got the same copy. And then where we both got, sorry, the same two copies. This is where we both got, you know, only one of the two copies, but a different other copy. And that's where we got just two different copies um, of, of the DNA. So what, what happens at these locations? That's where recombination events happen. And you can count the number of recombination events by comparing your DNA to the DNA of your siblings. And you can see basically how many recombination events do you have per chromosome, you know, through the four meiosis events that gave rise to you and to your siblings. So the basic biological function of this is that during metaphase, the chromosomes line up, and during anaphase, they're basically taken into the two daughter cells. And if the chromosomes don't line up correctly, then you end up with inviable cells, with cells that have many copies of uh, you know, one chromosome and a few copies of another chromosome and so, so forth. And there are genetic disorders associated with that. For example, trisomy 21, is a viable uh, segregation of the 21st chromosome with two copies going into one and zero copies going into the other, leading eventually to the child having actually three copies. So how do you prevent these non uh, sort of um, non homologous, uh, sorry, these, these um, events that basically don't split the chromosomes equally? So the way that you that the um, you know cells of every species have evolved to do that is that you line up the chromosomes by these double-stranded breaks in one of the two chromosomes that then lead to 
repair from homologous recombination that eventually leads to either a non-crossover correction, where you basically synthesize the DNA based on the strand invasion and correction, or sometimes a crossover event. So these recombinations basically happen because of the act of lining up the chromosomes during meiosis. So recombination is actually crucial for lining up chromosomes during meiosis and gamete formation. And recombination starts with a double-stranded break, which is then repaired by strand inversion, invasion of the homologous chromosome. And repair can lead to either gene conversion, where you've basically now repaired it with the other copy. Now you have a blue chromosome with a red segment, uh, which now has been lost from the blue copy. And that's gene conversion. Or you could actually result in recombination where you don't have a blue chromosome anymore, but you have a blue followed by red, where you end up with these recombination uh, events. Okay, And that's one of the fundamental selective advantages of sexual uh, reproduction, the fact that you can actually have two copies of um, uh, every allele, and you can line up these correctly, and you can have you know, dominant recessive effects, and so on and so forth. OK? So who's with me so far on sort of the mechanistic basis of these recombination events, where um, you basically break up this continuity of inheritance between, say, my brother and me? Awesome. So we have 70%, 25%, 0, 5, 0. Um, OK, so notice that there's a very small number of these events. And the reason is that to line up your chromosomes, you basically have a very small number of spots where you need to align them. And the other reason, that's the reason for having them, the reason for not having more, is that double-stranded breaks can actually lead to damage. Double-stranded breaks can you know, wreak havoc on the DNA. So recombination uh, does not happen uniformly over each chromosome. Yes, there's a very small number of events between my brother and me. And there's a very sm small number of events between any siblings and between every generation. But the other key insight is that the where these events happen is actually very non-random. These happen in very specific hotspots of recombination, which occur roughly every 100,000 nucleotides. And they occur within these regions hundreds of times more often in these hotspots. And in mouse, molecular studies of this event and this process revealed that PRDM9 is actually the protein that demarcates these hotspots. That's what I like to say. That's what I like to call the tragic love story of PRDM9. So what, why is it a tragic love story? Because PRDM9 has a motif that it knows uh, and loves. It basically loves to bind that motif. But the problem is that every single time it binds that motif in the genome, it causes a break in the DNA to lead to recombination, followed by repair from the homologous chromosome. So that basically means that if one uh, copy of the DNA has a motif that matches its favorite site, then it will actually kill it by binding it. And it will basically be replaced by the copy that it, by, it likes less, that it loves less, that it does, doesn't bind as well. So that basically leads to this very funny game of selection where as PRDM9 is binding all of these sites in the genome, it's causing loss of its motif. And therefore, it evolves rapidly to adapt to another motif that is now not as destroyed by its own binding. And that as it's adapting, that other motif that it now prefers to recognize will also get depleted. And it will just need to mutate again to recognize a new motif and so on and so forth. Okay, so. That leads to this enormous positive selection for rapid evolution of the DNA binding zinc finger domain of the uh, PRDM9 protein with more than 40 known PRDM9 alleles, each with a different DNA binding specificity. And of course, the repair double-stranded break no longer contains this motif, leading to 
an evolutionary competition between the protein and its motif. Okay. So if you now look at where are these recombinations happening because of this very rapid evolution of PRDM9, these hotspots of recombination are happening differently between say your Ruben populations in Africa, Central European populations, and then you know Chinese, Han, and Japanese uh, populations. So what this leads to is actually differences in the specific binding. But then the first feature, that's the second feature that I want you to notice that there are differences you know, between populations. But the first feature that I want you to notice is that there are haplotype blocks in the genome. And the reason for those blocks is that PRDM9 prefers to bind in this location and in that location, in this location, leading to these hundredfold more frequent recombination in those places than in other places in the genome. So these recurrent recombination events occur at specific hotspots. And this R squared correlation between the SNPs that is found. So basically red here is how correlated are these pairs of SNPs across these locations. These correlations depend on the historical order in which they arose, not necessarily their physical order on the chromosome. So that's why you don't just see contiguous blocks, but you see these sort of stretches here with a new SNP that happened in the context of an ancient uh, haplotype. So how do we measure these um, blocks? What we, you know, they're known as uh, haplotype blocks or blocks of linkage disequilibrium or LD blocks. What is linkage disequilibrium? Well, first of all, equilibrium would be if the uh, alleles are co-segregated, uh, you know, the, roughly the frequency you would expect. And disequilibrium means that you have, you're deviating from this equilibrium. That basically that they occur that say a G here and an A here occur together more often than you would expect by chance if the two alleles were randomly segregating, okay? So that's basically the fudging that Mendel had to do to come up with his law of independent assortment. Uh, and of course, there's some uh, debate as to whether this was fudged or not. But basically, the uh, alleles, the, 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 the genetic loci that Mendel had found were in fact largely independent from each other, except for some exceptions. And the data looked a little too good uh, suggesting that, you know, he may have actually fudged that deviation thinking that he may have miscounted or something like that. And that's sort of the whole basis of genetic mapping, this deviation. So now linkage disequilibrium is when you found pairs of alleles that are not segregating independently, but are co-segregating. So genetic variants do not segregate independently when they're close to each other in the, in the chromosome. And you can basically measure the coefficient of linkage disequilibrium between allele A and allele B at loci L1 and L2. And that DAB is simply the product of these uh, opposite locations in the table. So the 1, 1 at the bottom, the 0, 0 at the top left, and then the 1, 0, and the 0, 1 in the off diagonals. So if you basically measure this you know, um, difference here, that basically gives you the amount of linkage equilibrium that you know, you're observing at that location. So it's a property of the specific alleles, not of the loci. And different alleles at this loci have a different D or D prime. So what's D? D is that disequilibrium. And if they're independent, the disequilibrium is zero. That means that they're in equilibrium. That means that they're segregating independently when the product is the same. And the reason for that is simply that the product that you would expect for you know, each of these alleles is simply um, you know, the product of those uh, you know, individual frequencies. So if you have basically uh, zero with frequency, you know, 0.54 and a one with frequency 4, 0 0.45, 0 0.46 at one locus, and then 0.3 and 0.6 at the other locus, the product of those basically gives you the expected uh, haplotype of zero, zero, which is the product of those two. And this is sort of driven simply by the product of those. And then if you observe deviation from that, that basically tells you that the two are in fact in leakage disequilibrium from each other. It measures the degree of departure from Mendel's law of independent assortment. So the problem of course, is that to interpret the actual values, because these values depend on the allele frequencies, 
you need to normalize. And that's where D prime comes in. So basically you can ask for a particular ideal frequency at a location. Um, you can have a DAB max, which depends on the frequencies and gives you the, po the maximum possible uh, deviation uh, from equilibrium. And then D prime is just the ratio of D to D max, which is in this particular case, 51% which basically tells you that 51% of the maximum possible disequilibrium enabling you now to use this D prime measure at different loci with different allele frequencies. All right, let's see who's with me so far. <clears throat> awesome. So uh, 30, 45, 20, 0, 5. Um, so that's one measure, this D measure, but you can also uh, measure the, uh, you know, more directly the linkage to equilibrium R squared, the correlation between these alleles. So basically, this is the squared Pearson correlation of the two SNPs to each other. And in practice, the Pearson correlation is very efficiently computed for all SNPs in, you know, windows such as, you know, as X prime X divided by N. And that's a fundamental quantity that is used for modeling genome-wide association studies z-scores. So the key property is that the R-square correlation for individual SNPs is exactly the R-square of the GWAS association summary statistic for those SNPs. You can basically measure this by taking the D-squared and then dividing by the product the, by the product of the individual uh, state frequencies for each of those. So basically what the HAPAP project did is catalog uh, these haplotype blocks across different populations. So basically, you know, the Central Europeans, Chinese, uh, you know, Mexican, uh, and Kenyan, and, you know, Yoruban, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the goal was to understand this haplotype structure of the human population based on the shared variation, both within and between groups of humans. And the fundamental knowledge that this enabled is now allowing us to carry out genome association studies, EQTLs, by systematically cataloging these millions of SNPs across these 11 subpopulations across the globe, and then inferring haplotypes, which are these co-inherited blocks whose co-inheritance you can measure using these D prime and R squared. Uh, and then it genotyped 270 individuals using these DNA microarrays. So basically what we're learning is that not only are these blocks spanning thousands of nucleotides at a time, but these blocks are actually threaded to each other in non-random ways. So there's relatively few haplotypes that exist in the human population. Instead of the two to the 10 million possible haplotypes that you would expect with 10 million SNPs, you basically have a tiny, tiny, tiny number by comparison. So that basically implies a very high level of genotype sharing, even for unrelated individuals. And you can see here just one representation of the linear genomic variation the genes uh, here with all of their exons in green, and then all of the genetic variation and how the genetic variation is threaded together in these haplotype blocks. So the key insight is that mutations don't happen all together. They didn't just all happen in Africa and then there's no more mutations. Mutations happen in the background of haplotype blocks you basically have this ancestral haplotype. And then, for example, in Europe, we might have this red haplotype. And then, you know, I don't know, in Asia, you might have this blue haplotype. And then in Africa, you might have this orange haplotype. And then in the background of that haplotype, you have additional mutations that are occurring. So the green mutations happen, I don't know, only in Egypt in recent years in the context of, uh, you know, an existing diversity. And this one might only happen in Nigeria, you know, a few, you know, a thousand years ago um, that happened in the context of that haplotype, okay? So basically with 36 SNPs spanning 9KB, you would expect two to the 36 possible allele combinations. So if you sample 120 parental European chromosomes, in practice, you find that 31 of them have exactly the same SNP, set of SNPs, 45 have exactly that, and 29 have exactly that and so on and so forth. So in practice, there's only five recurrent haplotypes and then two singletons, one here and one there. 
So it's remarkable how much less variation there is. Why is that exciting? That basically means that in order to figure out all of the SNPs that the vast majority of Europeans carry across these 9,000 uh, nucleotides, all I need to do is sample one, two, three, four, five SNPs. So by measuring only five SNPs, I can tell apart the red one from the blue one, from the orange one, from the green one, okay? So that means that I can carry out a genome-wide association study with dramatically less probes, dramatically fewer probes than what I would need if I were to resequence the entire genome, okay? Uh, who's with me here on this concept on the fact that all I need to do is sample enough SNPs to be able to reconstruct a haplotype that each person carries rather than having to profile every single SNP in the genome. So not only is only a tiny subset of genomic locations, namely one in a thousand, actually variable, but among the variable locations, I don't even need to profile all of them because by profiling a subset, I can in fact computationally infer the rest. So 60, 40, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so, so that's a blessing. The blessing is that we basically can profile only a handful of loci uh, of SNPs and then infer the entire haplotype. The curse is that even if I went and profiled every single SNP in this locus, because of the co-inheritance, I still wouldn't know what is responsible for the association. So I showed you in the example of obesity that these 89 common variants were all associated with obesity in the risk allele, in the risk haplotype. So that basically means that I don't know which one causes it. You know, I can, I can ask, well, are you the one? Uh, are you the one? Are you the one? It's very hard to tell because they're all co-inherited, okay? So the blessing is that we can test very few and infer the haplotype. The curse is that even if we tested all of them, the association lies at the level of an entire haplotype rather than at the level of SNPs. So you need a lot more data in order to have a sufficient number of recombination events in order to be able to genetically fine map to infer what are the driver nucleotides in any one location, okay? One tool that can help in fine mapping is multi-ethnic studies. I can carry out my association in a European and in an Asian population. And because they have different LD block boundaries, I might be able to actually you know, you know, fine map the, the location to only a subset of variants that are associated in both populations. Okay, everybody with me on this one? Great. An alternative way of fine mapping is to basically look at epigenomic information. And we're gonna talk about that at the next lecture where you can basically look at the annotation of those SNPs and based on the annotations say that only this SNP here is compatible with the global properties for that genome-wide association study, enabling me to map with high resolution what are the likely variants that are driving this association. All right, so we talked about haplotypes, recombination, linkage disequilibrium, and then uh, how you know the, the underlying biology reading to these recombination hotspots with a tragic love story of PRDM9 and its rapid protein and motif evolution. We talked about different ways of measuring linkage disequilibrium between D, D prime, and R squared. And we talked about haplotype blocks. Let's now look at how we can actually solve this problem that I mentioned earlier of how do you choose those SNPs? And once you have those SNPs, how do you infer the remaining intermediate events in this uh, haplotype? So let's talk about imputation and phasing. So the goal of genotype imputation is now you've gone ahead and measured only this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, that one. And you'd like to infer what is the value of all of the remaining missing SNPs. So the goal is to infer the genotypes at the unobserved SNPs. But the challenge with that is that it actually requires phased reference haplotypes. So a sub problem that we need to solve in order to infer the missing uh, information is to actually first from the genotypes that I have infer the phasing 
And then from the phasing, I will get the missing data for free. And the key intuition is that the same haplotype copying model for the phasing applies to genotype imputation. That basically we have to phase alleles for genotype SNPs and then copy the alleles for the unobserved variants and recover the genotypes by some of the inferred haplotypes. So then the key idea is that if I see these particular five locations that are measured, I can infer that I have the blue haplotype here with the red haplotype here. I'm a little uncertain about what I have in the middle. And then I have the blue haplotype here and the red haplotype here, okay? And the reason for that is that there's only a small number of possible haplotypes in the human population that I can choose from. So as I'm trying to quote unquote, explain the observable data, I have only a small number of possible explanators and I have to walk through switching as to what my explanation is at every uh, location. So who's with me so far? So basically what I need to do is infer how did I get these genotypes? And the way to infer that is to walk along the genome and then infer what is the most likely haplotype that is explaining my current data. And once I have that haplotype, then imputation is actually trivial because I can just simply copy over the remaining uh, SNPs from that haplotype. So if I know that I have the red and the blue haplotype, then I can fill in the missing information and therefore I can fill in the missing genotypes. All right, so we have 30%, 64, 700. All right, so let's talk about phasing. The goal is to resolve genotypes to the underlying haplotypes, and this requires the auxiliary information of either the parent genotypes or some LD information. So again, if I have the child here of 0120120 and the mom and the dad, uh, you know, if I have those, I can basically start inferring the homozygous sites trivially. If I have zero and zero here, I know that I got zero from both. If I have two and two here, I know that I got one from each and so on and so forth, okay? The challenge is of course, when I have a one here, a one here and so on and so forth, where I don't know whether I got it from, um, you know, mom or from dad for every one of those locations, okay? So the, you know, the homozygous sites can be trivially phased and then if at least one parent is homozygous, then there's no ambiguity left. So basically here, I know that I have a one here and dad is a zero. So I can only have gotten it from mom. And there, I know that, um, uh, you know, both mom has one copy with a one and one copy with a zero. And dad has one copy with a one, one copy with a zero. So it's very unclear at this location how I got my one, whether I got it from mom or from dad. So basically both parents are heterozygous, then I actually need linkage to equilibrium to resolve the remaining ambiguous sites. So there's a lot of tools that have been built for phasing these unrelated individuals. So here's one uh, such tool that basically considers collections of unrelated individuals without any pedigree information, but only the patterns of linkage to equilibrium. So the input is face haplotypes in a reference panel. So using my reference panel, I have a set of haplotypes that I can choose from. And then the other input is the observed genotypes for one individual from that population, one sample from that population. And then as I'm walking through, I have this hidden Markov model that basically tells me which uh, haplotype is preferable at this location. And then the transitions between them are in fact these recombination events, okay? So the unobserved haplotypes underlying the observed genotypes can be traced back to a common ancestor with the reference panel and directly fitting this uh, series of recombination events that we call this ancestral recombination graph. So this ARG or ARG is basically telling you how every single individual in a particular sample is related to each other based on every single recombination event that has occurred along the genome, okay? So we can directly fit the ARG, but that's intractable for large samples, so we can approximate it. 
we can generate each of the unobserved haplotypes by copying segments from the reference haplotypes such that the resulting genotypes match the observations, okay? Then every single recombination corresponds to a switching which reference haplotype we're copying from. And this model needs to infer where the recombination events are occurring. So if you can try all possible sets, that's intractable. So instead you can slide a window over the genome and consider whether there's a recombination at the location or whether there's no recombination. And you can compress the redundancy in the reference haplotypes representing uh, it as paths through a graph of recombination events. Okay. All right. So we've covered a lot of material, but we're still not done. So, um, you know, I'll continue for another uh, 10 minutes approximately to try to cover some of the remaining awesome topics. But I think these are really the basis uh, of what you need for GWAS and EQTL. So I, I don't mind spending a little more time on that. All right, so then let's talk now about human relatedness. If you look at how many variant sites there are per genome, you see that the Finnish population has roughly four, uh, you know, variant sites per million. Um, whereas the African populations have an enormous higher variation uh, because that standing variation of the human population was not subsampled in the out of Africa event for these populations. And then some of the admixed uh, populations, uh, you know, from Mexico or from uh, Latin America are basically showing a combination of uh, this high variation and low variation based on uh, the fraction of the genome that corresponds to each of those populations. A very cool concept that I want you to sort of keep in mind is that we can in fact estimate the diversity of a population by looking at every single uh, location in the genome and asking how much variation is there at that location, you know, as I go further and further back in time. And what you can uh, estimate from that is the effective population size at every location in the genome and the distribution of those as you go back through time. That's the number of individuals that is needed in an ideal uh, model to recapitulate the population properties. So using this approach, you can estimate using individuals from each of those populations, just how many alleles coalesce at such a distance or at such a distance or at such a distance and at such a distance, effectively inferring based on the variation, the distribution of the amount of variation across the genome, the ancestral population size for those individuals. And if you do this for most you know, human populations, you basically see that there was a dramatic expansion in the population size, followed by a dramatic reduction, that's the bottleneck that you know, all human populations went through, followed by a re-expansion in the um, you know, current uh, population. So if you look at Bengali, for example, you see this enormous additional variation added. If you look at Han Chinese, uh, you see this expansion here. If you look at Finland, you see less of an expansion, but they all share the same bottleneck. And if you look at these, uh, you know, Far East Asian uh, populations, you see this sort of additional drop in the variation, potentially another bottleneck. So, but if you look at the African populations, you don't see uh, as much reduction but you see, and, and you don't see as much expansion as well. Um, and, you know, that, that gives you a sense. So when you now look at individuals from a mixed ancestry, where they have, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa and European and East Asian, you can actually paint their chromosomes according to the uh, ancestral segment that the haplotypes that you've now painted onto that genome have come from. Okay, and therefore you can say, okay, this person has this segment that has an Ashkenazi Jew uh, origin, or, uh, you know, this uh, person has a Native American ancestry in that segment here, or a West African ancestry for, you know, about two thirds of their genome and so on and so forth, and European ancestry for about 20% of their genome. So you can use this uh, painting by using a latent Dirichlet allocation model and then uh, assigning these topics, i.e. these ancestral population ethnicity backgrounds uh, to every segment of their genome as you scan through. 
So you can basically look at the ancestry mixture for that individual, the genotype frequency, and the corresponding populations. So RFMIX is one such program that basically uses a random forest classifier to predict the source population of each local segment using the allele frequencies in the reference populations and then uh, outputting which population every observed segment came from. So you can basically scan across using this conditional random field, which is kind of like an HMM, but it has conditional probabilities rather than generative uh, models. And using that, you can basically paint every single individual as a column based on the fraction of their genome that can be assigned to each of those populations. So if you look at Southern European individuals, well, they mostly have Southern European ancestry with some Northern European ancestry. If you look at Northern European individuals, they mostly have Northern European with some Southern European. If you look at Southeast Asia across different countries, you have some European uh, admixture. If you look at East Asia, you basically have, you know, for Japan, mostly East Asian uh, chromosomes. And then, you know, for others, you have more Central Asia. If you look at East Africa versus West Africa and so on and so forth. So every individual is a mixture of many ancestral populations. There's no such thing as a pure, uh, you know, uh, ancestry in, you know, the vast majority of humans. And what's really cool is that you can take this matrix of genotypes by individuals and infer the principal components of that matrix. You can basically carry out singular value decomposition exactly as we saw two lectures ago and decompose this genotype by individual matrix. For every, allele, for every location, what is the allele that they have? And when you do that in a sample of European individuals, you basically have this map that places individuals according to the country where they were sampled and what you can see is that the first principal component is in fact the north-south uh, you know, uh, gradient of Europe. And then the second principal component is in east-west gradient of Europe, recapitulating exactly the history of migrations that gave rise to those populations to, together and the history of uh, you know, um, intermixing between these individuals. And, and that again tells you about the continuity of the human population. And these principal components are extremely important in carrying out genome-wide association studies. When you start looking at phenotypic variation and how that relates to genotype variation, then you need to correct for the fact that, you know, if you have an association with height, for example, it might simply be due to ancestry. If you have an association with asthma, it might simply be due to, uh, to ancestry rather than um, you know, a specific phenotypic variation. So very often we take those principal components, which are population level effects, and we correct them out in order to then look at the residual genotype by genotype, uh, you know, location by location, SNP by SNP associations, okay? So you can basically quantify this divergence between populations using this fixation index, FST, that basically compares pairs within a subpopulation and then start understanding how did these populations diverge from each other and then inferring what is the evolutionary history of the European continent, but also what is the evolutionary history of all of the migrations across uh, you know, the human population. So you can basically trace mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited only from the mother, or Y chromosome DNA, which is only inherited from the father, and then infer the history of haplotype groups in the human population. And this is basically what we see. We see this you know, um, ancient tree in Africa. You see this out of Africa event that basically gave rise to Europe, but also uh, Australia and also the Americas. You see the second migration that basically you know, went uh, into uh, same, you know, several of the same locations. And then uh, this mixture of uh, human migrations uh, upon migrations. So if you look at the aboriginals in Australia, you basically see that it's the same out of Africa event and that it actually coincides. If you look at North Indians, you basically see this evidence of admixture with Eurasians, but you don't see that in South Indians, which basically suggests another migration concurrent with both history and mythology. If you look at the recent migration into India, in India you basically see this gradient of admixture going from Europe to North India to South India. If you look at South America, 
you see this wave of migrations with a sex bias on the X chromosome because the subsequent waves of migration were more likely to maintain the females of that population rather than the males, leading to an increased uh, ancestry of the Native American on the X chromosome. If you look at South America, you basically see this uh, history of migration again with the same gradient of admixture. And if you look at, uh, for example, Argentina, you see that the European uh, influence starts from the Andes and goes towards the Atlantic rather than the other way around because of the history of the migrations. If you look at the recent uh, uh, admixture of African chromosomes with the slave trade uh, into America with this mixture with uh, European, you basically again see these you know, multiple migration events with uh, the slave trade. And if you look at ancient human DNA, you see that 2% of all non-African genomes are in fact derived from the Neanderthal genome. And if you look at the Ust Ishim Man, who basically lived in uh, Iberia, in the Iberian Peninsula, 45,000 years ago, you see that it also has 2% Neanderthal DNA, suggesting this early and prolonged contact between uh, Neanderthal and modern human. You see this interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthal about 50,000 to 60,000 years ago. And again, you see this South Asian uh, ancestry from the Nisovans, another ancient uh, hominid DNA that has now you know, sort of been found throughout this subsequent migration. So first out of Africa, then mixing with Neanderthal, mixing with the Nisovan, and then uh, spreading to the rest of the world. Okay. So that's where I'm going to stop today. We're not going to talk about measuring human selection, but we talked about genetic variation, the history of human genetics, understanding genetic variation and mapping it from these Mendelian to the common variants, understanding haplotypes, recombination, linkage to equilibrium, methods for imputation and phasing of the missing data, and then how to paint human relatedness and population differences onto these haplotypes, how to correct using prism component analysis uh, for the uh, population effects prior to doing your genetic association studies. And then we talked about human demographic history and this history of evidence of migrations across all of the human continents, and also with mixing with DNA from Neanderthals and Denisovans and so on and so forth. So that gives us the basis now. We haven't yet talked about phenotypic variation. That gives us the basis for understanding phenotype on top of that. So we now have the genetic variation component. Uh, at the next lecture, we're going to look at the phenotypic variation component. Okay, so who feels that they've learned stuff uh, today? So let's see, stop, launch polling. Um, great. Lovely. <clears throat> So 60%, uh, 40%, and then zero, zero, zero. All right. Thanks, everyone. And then uh, see you for office hours today and then uh, mentoring session tomorrow. Announcements about that. Thank you. Bye-bye.